Good afternoon. My name is Kenya Crawford, and I'm one of the co-coordinators for the 34th Annual Winter Roundtable Conference. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Janet Helms. Dr. Janet Helms is the founding director of the Institute for Study and Promotion of Race and Culture at Boston College, the past president of Division 17, and a fellow of Division 17, 35, and 45 of the American Psychological Association. Dr. Helms is also a member of the Association for Black Psychologists. In addition to her roles as a scholar and a researcher, she has served as a mentor for both practitioners and aspiring academics. She makes time for her students for whom she is responsible, and she also gives her time to undergraduates, graduate students, and colleagues from around the country that seek her guidance. In 1991, she was the first annual recipient of the Janet E. Helms Award here at Teachers College. She received many distinguished research awards between 2002 and 2010. She was an inaugural recipient of the 2012 Elizabeth Herlock Beckman Award for mentoring. She has written over 80 empirical and theoretical authors and four books on topics of racial identity development and cultural influences on assessment and counseling practice. Her books include A Race is Not a Thing to Have and Using Race and Culture in Counseling and Psychotherapy. Please join me in welcoming the esteemed Dr. Janet Helms. Thank you, Kenya and TC, for inviting me. Good afternoon. See, I know you all just came from lunch. <laughs> and in my culture, uh, which is indigenous African American, we were, of course, the first largest group of immigrants of color. There is a custom that when someone says, good afternoon to you, you say good afternoon to them back. In this case, it's going to be important for me to know that you are my friends, at least starting out, because I am talking about a topic that we don't talk about and that some people would find threatening. So to make me feel better, could we try that again? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I am going to be talking about violence and death of black girls and women that goes unnoticed essentially in our society. So let me start with a caveat. Black men and native men are killed at higher rates than anyone else in the country. And so to talk about black girls and women who have a lower rate of being killed it's not to say that I don't think the death and killing of black men are important issues to discuss. But what I hope to accomplish is to get us to thinking about how black girls and women are also important, to help us consider and be aware that black women and girls are the backbone of the black community. They're the people who support all of the causes. Most of the anti-violence against black men causes were, were uh, developed by black women. The civil rights actions have all had supported black, black women who often went unacknowledged. So when I talk about black women, it is not to minimize the um, horrors that affect uh, other, uh, that affect men of color, but it's merely to get us to begin to focus on a group that we uh, almost never uh, consider as important enough to consider. Um, I, because of the theme of the conference, I took a look at the Ferguson Report. And so um, hopefully these topics I'm going to cover, uh, I'm gonna talk some about the Ferguson Report and police violations of black women's constitutional rights. Um, I talk about these things because 
What happened in Ferguson seems to happen nationally. I want to talk about gender violence uh, against uh, and gender violence against black women and girls. Uh, and I may mention white women as I do that by way of comparison. I want to talk about invisibi invisibility theory as a psychological paradigm for explaining why no one cares about the fate of black women. I will talk about race and gender because when we talk about uh, killing of African Americans, that's what we say, African Americans. And people hear African Americans to mean African American men. We rarely see the statistics separated by gender. And then I will conclude, hopefully, with what's a black woman supposed to do? Uh, maybe you'll give me the answers to those questions. Now, I never actually get through everything I intend to get through, so we'll, I'll give it a good uh, Boston College try and see what happens. Let us start with uh, an audience participation exercise that I partially adapted from Kimberly Crenshaw. So to help me with this exercise, would everyone stand up? Um, and because I just committed a microaggression, if you can't stand up, just signify your presence by uh, whatever means that you can do that. Thank you. Now, the rules of this procedure is, or I, there's only one actually. When I mention a name that you do not recognize, sit down. If at the end of the names I mention you are still standing, then you get to do this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how this works. Michael Brown. You want, you want the rule again? Yeah. It, <laughs> if you do not know, you sit. Knowledge is power, so if you have power, you get to stand. Michael Brown. Eric Garner. Tamir Rice. Philando Castile. Alton Sterling. Sandra Bland. Tanisha Anderson. Corinne Gaines, Janet Wilson, Yvette Smith, Marion Carey, Natasha McKenna. Okay, we have one person standing who's going to do the lecture today. <laughs> or actually, maybe we have two people standing. I was just joking, you don't really get to do that lecture. <laughs> so, did you notice that for the most part, I didn't lose any people when I was mentioning the names of the uh, men and boys who were killed by police? All of the names of women I uh, listed or read were women who were either killed directly by police or were killed mysteriously while they were in police custody. And so to the answer to the question of whether they're really invisible is that we rarely hear about and therefore we don't know about the women who are killed by police under mysterious circumstances. In the Ferguson report, the, when we used to have an, which was written when we used to have an attorney general. <laughs> a report was written about how law enforcement was violating the rights of their primarily black citizens. And the report actually talks about police violence as well as the violence of the court system. So. Uh, Systemic violence is defined in a couple of different ways. I'm going to focus primarily on police action because 
police action actually is the uh, impetus for uh, why I want to talk about violence against women. In the Ferguson report, uh, the uh, authors point out that often the First Amendment rights of people are broken. So they're not allowed the freedom of speech or the right uh, to assemble peaceably. If you remember Ferguson, when the people tried to uh, assemble peaceably, they brought out the military. It was sort of like the government was at war with its people. The Fourth Amendment says the people have the right not to have themselves, their houses, papers, and effects searched or seized without a lawful warrant. Uh, as we will see in Ferguson, that happened often, and that happens pretty often in our society generally. The Fourth Amendment says the states and local government officials must not deprive people of their life, liberty, or property without legislative authority. And they have to provide equal protection under the law to all people. In the Ferguson report, this um, amendment, these rights were clearly violated. So let's see uh, briefly some of the ways that it showed up in Ferguson, and later we will see that it also shows up more generally with women. The, police, the Supreme Court says that police cannot constitutionally make arrest decisions based on people's use of disrespectful speech about police officers, even if they use foul language. The uh, Supreme Court explicitly said that it's acceptable for a person to call a per police officer an uh, effing pig if they want to, as long as they have not committed a, any other kind of crime. So they're entitled to freedom of speech. In Ferguson, freedom of speech was a reason for arresting uh, primarily girls. And here was an example. A group of African American girls were, in the police officer's words, play fighting. Um, and as he was talking to them, one of the girls gave the uh, salute to a white witness. The police officer wanted to arrest her for that and ordered her friend to leave. Her friend didn't want to leave because she didn't trust that the police officer would treat her, her friend fairly. So the police officer arrested her too. Each of the girls were charged with six offenses, including endangering a minor, which was themselves. So now they have a police right, uh, record for essentially um, doing what was their right under the Constitution, was to, which was to express their dissatisfaction with their situation. Other than that, they were not accused of any crime. Uh, all crimes that follow had to do with police officers believing that if you speak in a way that the police officer thinks is disrespectful, then he has the right to charge you with crimes. The Fourth Amendment, people have the right not to have themselves, their houses, papers, and effects searched or seized without a lawful warrant. An officer cannot require a woman to identify herself unless the officer has a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity to initiate a stop. In Ferguson, an officer arrested two sisters who were sitting in an idling car in front of their own house. He arrested one because she refused to provide her identification when he told her to. He arrested the other for getting out of the car when he ordered her to stay. He doesn't have the right to do either of those things under the Fourth Amendment, Amendment unless he has a reason to believe that they have committed a crime that would result in their being arrested. He didn't have any evidence of that. So now they have a record for uh, uh, also six different offenses, one being failure to comply with an officer. The Fourth Amendment pertains to unreasonable use of force. In the Ferguson uh, situation, police rely on lasers quite a lot. They use lasers to uh, bring pe mentally ill people under control. They use lasers as a way to punish women for not behaving in the ways that they should. An example being a woman who was a passenger in a car that was speeding. The police stopped the car and uh, 
asked the passenger to get out. She got out, and then the officer said, get back in. And she wasn't moving fast enough. And she, she was swinging her legs and arms, uh, and the officer took offense at that, even though she was not swinging her legs or arms at him. He tasered her legs. That is a violation of her Fourth Amendment. She wasn't suspected of any crime. The use of tasers to uh, control people is common in police practice. Between 2001 and 2014, there were uh, between 634 and 869 deaths by taser. The reason why you will find f throughout my presentation that numbers differ is because there is no systematic way of collecting data, particularly data that pertains to violence and deaths of black women. And so what one has to do is to go to various internet resources and see what you can find and then try to eliminate the overlapping information and add new information. African Americans accounted for 42% of the 283 deaths in 2009 through 2014. Uh, Electronic Village is the website that documented that. 117 were men. Uh, using a particular form of punishment more on a uh, racial group, so uh, is a violation of the 14th Amendment, it's discriminatory practice. There, the um, Electronic Village says that one 62-year-old woman was tasered to death. Um, I also found one 37-year-old woman who was tasered to death during the same time period. There was, in, in neither of these cases, was there evidence that there was any reason to use extreme force on these two uh, African-American women, or for that matter, the men who were tasered. Blacks were 13.6% of the population, but they were 42% of the taser-related deaths. So clearly, when um, police historically have used tasers to control people, they have uh, violated their 14th Amendment in rights in most cases. There is no gender definition for using un, uh, unreasonable force. That is, we don't actually know what constitutes um, unreasonable force where women are concerned and specifically where black women and girls are concerned. I've become afraid of the people who are supposed to protect me and to take care of me. That fear, she said, came from a clash with Officer Brian Richter. You see your driver's license, you're being stopped for speeding. What happened is caught on his patrol car video, obtained exclusively by the KVU Defenders and the Austin American Statesman. Officer Richter says in this report that he asked King to close her car door should she try to run away. All right, take a seat back in your car so we can close the door. Put your feet back in the car so I can close the door. When she didn't immediately comply, he attempts to forcibly remove her, and things escalate fast. No, why are you kidding me? Oh my God! As their confrontation plays out, King is taken to the ground a second time. In his report, Officer Richter says he acted so quickly because King reached to the passenger side of the car. He says he didn't know if she had a weapon. He also said King showed what he called a, quote, uncooperative attitude and resisted by clutching her steering wheel, actions not caught on camera. King was charged with resisting arrest, a charge prosecutors immediately dismissed when they saw this video. I was trying to figure out why this happened to me. Oh my God, I was genuinely like fearful for my life. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And literally, I didn't understand why it was happening to me. But it doesn't end there. A few minutes later on her way to jail, a calmer King talks to another APD officer, Patrick Spradlin, about relations between officers and the black community. Because of their appearance and whatnot. Officer Spradlin has heard offering possible explanations about why some people fear African Americans. I can give you a really good, a really good idea why it might be that way. Violent tendencies. 
And I want you to, I want you to think about that. That's why a lot of the white people are afraid, and I don't blame them. Yeah. Some of them, because of their appearance and whatnot, some of them are very intimidating. After more than a year, the entire case is getting a new look. At the time, Officer Richter received the lowest level of discipline, counseling and training. But now, Police Chief Art Acevedo said the department is doing a full review, both of Officer Richter's use of force and Officer Spradlin's comments. The chief says he found those particularly offensive. I can tell you that those comments are not consistent with the expectations, the mindset, I think the uh, mindset that we want of our folks or anybody in law enforcement. Anybody. I was in disbelief. I was. King says she wants something done. If you've wronged someone and you have not been reprimanded, then how do you know that you, you're wrong? For her, she said the clash between her and Officer Richter has forever tarnished how she views the police. So notice in that video that um, the chief was most concerned about the officer's words. But what about the attack on her physical person? I have to wonder that whether if she were a white woman who had been subdued in that manner, whether he would have been equally calm about the physical attack on her being. The problem is, of course, that that form of attack is not unusual for black women. If you go on the internet and look at uh, takedown, uh, takedowns of black, of black women, you will find many examples of incidents in which black police officers are slamming black women to the ground and getting on top of them. If they were, uh, I started to say if they were any other man, if they were a man of color who did that, they would likely be arrested because that looks like assault. Where are the police policies that say how you may arrest women, and in this case, black women? Uh, where are the policies that say uh, it's unconstitutional to use unusual force, which is a huge man getting on top of a woman and expecting her not to, not to fight? There are no statistics, and so we don't know how often that happens. But my guess is every time we hear that a black woman has been arrested, we ought to be asking the question, how was she subdued? There are various types of anti-woman black police violence. I uh, break it down into categories. Uh, lethal violence, where police on purpose kill black women, um, either because they did commit a crime or because the police officer thinks they committed a crime or because the police officer is trying to stop them from committing a crime. And then there are the incidental killings that occur when uh, police officers are killing or subduing black men and boys. Um, subordinating is when the police officer sets out to punish or teach the black girl or woman how to behave. And so these kinds usually are physical assaults um, in which they engage in activities that would be considered crimes if perpetrated by regular people. Um, there's torture. Um, there are on the uh, internet, you will find examples of police officers shackling pregnant women. There are sexual assaults, gang rape, and sexual, extort sexual extort extortion uh, occurs uh, frequently. There was recently a, a case in Texas in which a, a, a man of color went to jail for a police officer of color, I should say, went to jail for requiring women to perform sexual acts on him, black women to perform sexual acts on him as a way of getting uh, him not to charge them with crimes. There's throwing girls and women to the ground and mounting them, an example of which you saw. Uh, there are many others uh, which you uh, might want to take a look at. Uh, uh, you will find them uh, tormenting. The Washington Post does a database every year in which they look at the reasons why police use lethal violence against uh, people. 
I selected out the data from their 2015 database that looked at lethal violence against black and white women. Now it's true that uh, there are a smaller number of killings by police of women generally, and that if you just looked at numbers, uh, more white women than black women are killed, but then there are more white women than there are black women, and so that means the rate is actually higher for black women. But of the cases actually listed in the Washington Post, I looked at why the women were, were uh, killed. So 37% of the people, of the women who were killed were black women. Um, four of them, or 11%, were not armed. The police officers often mistook, mistakenly thought that they were armed and killed them by uh, mistake. Four were armed with knives. Two were armed with uh, guns, one of whom was apparently trying to commit suicide and so the police officer decided to help her. Uh, cell phone, screwdriver, and uh, car were other reasons why the women were killed. The officer saw the woman sitting in her car with a cell phone and thought it was a gun and he shot her. Uh, a homeless woman was on the street uh, fixing her cart and the officer thought the screwdriver was a weapon that she was going to use on him and he shot her. Uh, the car uh, was a tr actually one of the cases was a uh, transgender uh, woman who the police said ran a uh, uh, traffic check and so they shot her. Three of the women, or 23%, were mentally ill. For white women, 63%, only one was unarmed. Um, 15 were armed with, a, with an actual gun and were in the process of committing crimes. Um, what, three were armed with knives. Uh, 10 were mentally ill. Uh, other ways that, or the reasons for their being killed were a, a toy weapon and a car, using the car to threaten the police officer, so the officer said. If nothing else we could take from the Washington Post figures, information that Police are not trained to deal with mentally ill people, and so that should, police officers should not be the first people we call when we think someone needs mental uh, assistance. They're, they, they're likely to end up dead, and dead uh, mental illness shouldn't be a reason for killing people. We also, uh, if we look at the data, um, black women don't really have to be doing anything threatening in order to uh, be killed by police officers. And so whenever we hear, if we do hear, that lethal violence has been used against uh, black people, black women in particular, we need to do some investigating to find out what actually did happen. These are pictures of some of the women who have been killed that we don't know. Or some, one of you out there may know them, but not all of us know them. Uh, these are women who were killed since Michael Brown. Just a small sample of them. Uh, here are some of their stories. Tanisha Anderson, who was one of the names I asked you about, uh, her family called the police because she was having, a, she was mentally ill and she was out of control. The police allegedly, in trying to control her, slammed her head on the pavement and killed her. Uh, Corinne Gaines, uh, she was armed with the, the police came to her house looking for a man um, and they entered her house. They say that she was sitting on the living room floor with a rifle in her hand and her son in her arm and they say she waved the rifle and said some words. They discharged one round at her, and they say that she really said some words and discharged a round at them, and then they shot her three times. The interesting thing about this was not that they were uh, shooting her because she had a rifle. They were shooting her primarily because of her words. She was not allowed to talk to them in the way that she talked to them. Janet Wilson, uh, 
was um, the police were called to a shopping mall because she got into a dispute with a vendor at the mall. She left the mall and the police say that she uh, threatened guards who were at the mall, but they stopped her at a traffic light. When they asked her to stop, she stopped. They got out of the car, one went to the right and one went to the left, and they shot her dead through both the windows. Uh, Yvette Smith. Um, there was a fight in uh, the house where she lived between several men. Uh, someone made a 911 call, it may have been her. When they got to the house, the police ordered her out of the house, and she came out of the house. As she was coming out, they shot her twice as she walked through the door. Um, Miriam Carey, uh, you may remember this one. The uh, US Secret Service and Capitol Police shot her five times. Uh, this was a woman who uh, somehow got lost in Washington, D.C., which is not very hard if you drive in Washington, D.C. And she got lost and accidentally ran through a, a security checkpoint uh, near, the, near Congress. And they say that she refused to stop. And so she was driving away, and they shot her five times. Her child was in the car. Uh, sh her family says she had a history of mental illness. Uh, Natasha McKenna, I was going to show you the video for this one, but to be honest, it was too traumatizing for me to watch, so I, I figured it might be a little traumatizing for you too. Um, she was shackled, she was, in, she was in custody, she was mentally ill with schizophrenia. She was uh, shackled and she was wearing a hood. The police officers, uh, told her to put her hands through the bars so that they could handcuff her, which she did. But uh, then she decided that the handcuffs hurt. And so as she was walking, she said, you promised you wouldn't hurt me. And they took that as her being insubordinate. They tater tasered her many times. And she accidentally died as a result. And of course, you all know Sandra Bland. She died in police custody under mysterious circumstances. She was violently arrested. You will recall that she also was taken down. She was violently arrested for allegedly failing to use her turn signal. During the, during the interaction with the police officer, first you heard the officer asking her for an explanation, which he did not like, and then she stopped talking, and he did not like that either. And so she essentially ended up in jail because she talked in a way that the police officer did not like. But that was a violation of her First Amendment rights. In my version of invisibility theory, I talk about um, literal invisibility and figurative invisibility. How am I doing? Okay, I'll try to do this fast. <laughs> uh, literal invisibility. Um, there are policies and practices that equate African Americans with uh, with black uh, with African Americans with black men. So when we say African Americans, we mean black men and boys. We don't mean African American women. And when we say women, we mean white women. So what that means is that uh, African-American women and other women with intersecting racial identities are not included in the statistics. And so obtaining data on the prevalence rates for black girls and uh, uh, women, as I mentioned, requires you to be very persistent and willing to go through various sources to find that information. Figurative invisibility are the myths and stereotypes created especially for black women and girls and used as the basis for interacting with them. You saw in the clip that I did show you that the police officer had a variety of stereotypes about, about black men, actually, that he applied to the black woman. 
Here are some of the black women uh, stereotypes and myths. They're sexually um, promiscuous. Um, this one comes down from slavery time when the ways that white men justified their rapes of black women was that they were dominatrices who forced them into it. They're aggressive, they're loud, and their words are capable of castrating or feminizing black men. They're matriarchs, heads of households who deprive their sons of real men, uh, essentially, or uh, not acknowledged for holding the household together when, in fact, they often don't have a support system. A myth, double bonus, as black and women, uh, black women do not experience police violence. Well, we've seen that that is a myth. Black women do experience police violence. We just don't see it. Police uh, reportedly use excessive force at a very small rate, but the factors contributing to the excessive use of force are actual or anticipated violence. So if, um, if you think that people come from a group that's a violent group and you are a police officer, you're more likely to engage in, in activities that uh, violate their rights and may end up in their death. Stops and searches are often major violations that occur because police officers think the people will commit violence even though they have no reasonable suspicion that they have done so. Uh, defiance of police authority or contempt of cop. Contempt of cop actually across the nation means if you're using profanity or running away or do something that's a verbal affront to the police officer, then many police officers in the United States believe that gives them a right to uh, not only arrest you, that gives them a right to shoot you. If you remember, Michael Brown was actually running away when he got shot. Black women are socialized to use words to protect themselves. So imagine what happens when they come in contact with a police officer. Their uh, major strategy is to try to have a rational conversation because that's what they would do in their community. Uh, researchers show, for instance, that in the neighborhood, many black girls uh, will resist the uh, the uh, smack talk of men in their neighborhood by trying to explain to them, well, I'm too young to have a relationship with you, or you're too old to have a relationship with me. Police officers do not engage in rational conversation with black women. They believe, and they also definitely do not engage in emotional conversations with black women. Police officers believe that angry voices mean that they are being disrespected. Black women are socialized to use the words to nurture irrational men. And we saw that in the Philando Castile situation where the woman uh, actually ended up soothing the police officer who had just killed her fiance. And if we listen to the four-year-old in the background, she also was using words to try to soothe her, her mother. Black women are not socialized to avoid police violence, and it's not clear what such socialization would look like. When we uh, talk about police violence against um, uh, women, we need to begin to have more talk, more research that looks at the intersecting identities of race and gender. We need to figure out what actually would constitute anti-police violence strategies? Uh, how do we identify the characteristics of white male police officers who actually are the ones who commit most of the killings of people regardless of race and gender? Um, the few, relatively few occur be, uh, by white female officers and black female officers, uh, slightly more than occur for uh, black male officers, but much fewer than for white male officers. So certainly one strategy would be to diversify the police forces. We need to develop screening measures for police officers that explicitly ask about their racial gender stereotypes so that we can educate them before they get on the streets. Uh, of course, I have to get some white racial identity theory in here, so I'll do that quickly. Um, 
psychologists need to study why society is not concerned about the violence against black girls and women. In racial identity theory, we talk, I talk about uh, various schemas, various styles that uh, white people use to see and not see race. So contact, naivete, I don't see race, so police violence doesn't exist. Disintegration, confusion. I don't feel safe enough to talk about race, so I won't acknowledge police violence. Reintegration, whiteness is power. If she didn't obey, she, de she deserved what she got. And now we're seeing reintegration in action as states across the country begin to develop b uh, blue law hate crime uh, uh, bills, where if, you, if a police officer feels that he's been disrespected, then that's a reason for arresting people. What advice do we have for black women? <laughs> Don't talk to police. Because if you talk to police, then you are likely to find yourself dead. Don't not talk to police. Because if you not talk to police, you're likely to find yourself dead. Um, don't obey police orders. Because if you do obey the police orders, you're likely to find yourself dead. Don't not obey police orders, because if you not obey, you're likely to find yourself dead. Don't leave your house, because if you leave your house, you're likely to find yourself dead. Don't not leave your house, because if you don't leave your house, there's nothing that keeps police officers from coming in and shooting you, even if they're not looking for you, even if they're looking for someone else. Don't exist. Essentially, don't worry, I'm going to make it. <laughs> is, is essentially, that's what uh, society is communicating to women when they, uh, black women, when they punish them for being. But here's the takeaway. Even though black women have virtually no support from anyone other than other black women, we still exist. Uh, how we do it ought to be uh, modeled by other people because uh, we stand on our own. Like women, that ought to mean that when people criticize us for being too mouthy, being too aggressive, being too assertive, or whatever it is that they say about us, we need to ignore them because that's how we, uh, we reinforce each other that's how we manage to not be invisible, even when the world works in ways to make us invisible. Uh, that's my speech. Do I have three minutes? Okay, I think I have three minutes if you want to have some conversation. Uh, yes. Okay, um, I actually wrote a chapter about that. But let, let, me, just, <laughs> let, let me just uh, say it this way. We have to be able to recognize what comes from the outside versus what comes from the inside. The uh, imposing of stereotypes on us comes from the outside. We know that we are not aggressive. And so we have to be able to um, not take on that mantle and say what we need to say regardless of how people perceive what we say, because that's the only way we get to speak our truth. I think we also need to be aware that um, we need to call dehumanizing when we see dehum dehumanizing. And so if people see you as a stereotype, then you need to point out the stereotype to them. You need to ask them, 
or are you seeing me as aggressive because that's the stereotype you have of black women? Okay, so know our stereotypes so that uh, we are not wounded by them and that we can address them directly. Thank you, Dr. Helm. Is this working? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Helms, for shining light, uh, some more light on intersectionality and the experiences of black women uh, when it comes to police um, violence. I, I was, one of the things that I, I've been thinking a lot about, um, and I saw in your slides also that got me thinking about it some more, was intersectionality when it comes to white men and their masculinity and their, um, and their racism, right? So when we think about screening and when we think about training, I think one of the, the things that, that needs to be addressed, and I'm not sure how to do this because it's a pretty insular group, um, I think one of the things that needs to be addressed is men, and white men in particular in this case, and their sense of power and control and their need for that and the threats that they experience from the stereotypes that they have of black people in this country. And I'm not quite sure how to do that but I, I was curious about what your thoughts were. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I actually uh, wrote an op-ed. In reference to the election, actually, about white heterosexual male privilege. Uh, Hector's newsletter published it. Oh, there you are. The National Latino Psychology Today, is that? Yeah, so you can find it there. Um, but what I argue is that we have all of these isms, so racism, uh, sexism, uh, uh, heterosexual, heterosexism, uh, all of these isms, classism, that we keep trying to fix, but they're, they're symptoms. The actual cause of the illness is white, heterosexual, male privileged, and I would include uh, religion in there too, but... Um, Christian religion, but that messes up my acronym, so I just call it WIMP. <laughs> and so what that means is that whenever there is a, a racial incident, we have to look at what is the white heterosexual male privilege that's being threatened. And that's what we have to focus on rather than necessarily focusing on the sy symptoms. I think as long as we're diverted by the symptoms, then we end up with, for instance, a white house that's made up of white, heterosexual, privileged men. And as we can see, if you don't have the experience of examining yourself, examining your policies, then you end up messing up the lives of a whole lot of people. So. Focus on, focus on them, call them out, let them know that you see what's happening. Even if it means that your privilege might be in danger. Hi, Dr. Helms, I'm wondering where you uh, would place implicit bias and the importance of training e police officers, namely, but just people um, in general into that privilege framework. Um, because I, I'm thinking back and reflecting on people who have talked to about these things and they would deny any kind of st any stereotypes or myth that they might have about um, black and brown folk, but the implicit bias that's been there probably since childhood is still affecting the way that they may see the world. So um, I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Um, I never actually believe in implicit bias. Um, I mostly believe that if you are in a privileged group, in this case we're uh, talking about intersecting privileged groups, that you're socialized to live your particular existence. And so it takes someone outside this, this, your existence to show you how you do have privilege. I think um, uh, Daryl and Thomas were talking about that earlier. Um, some of the pushback I've gotten from writing about WIMP is that men who, are, who don't have a lot of economic resources write to me and say, well, I'm, I don't have economic resources and therefore I'm not privileged. But in fact, they're privileged because regardless of their social status in society, they're more advantaged than someone at the same social status who's a person of color. And so I think our task is to always counter those arguments with showing the person how they, had, how they do have privilege. 
um, they won't like it. But the more they hear it, the more they're likely to begin to think about those issues for themselves. Hi, Dr. Holmes, this is incredible. Um, thank, thank you for you. being here. Uh, so my master's thesis was about um, the socialization of white children into racism, into the racist um, culture that we live in. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the absence of uh, research into the childhood socialization processes of white racism. And also, I'm so nervous, this is incredible. <laughs> um, and also, um, the just what maybe what value we could find in going further into that work. I, I, I think a, a, a lot of the lack of literature for uh, white children in particular around racial socialization has to do with the fact that they grow up in non-diverse environments. Um, there is a myth going on in the world that I think, in the world, it's happening in England, but also in the US, that um, people of color outnumber white people. But in fact, the largest racial group in the United States now and maybe forever are white people. And so that means that white people can only live with white people if that's what they choose to do. For people of color, when they talk about us as a majority minority, um, what they are saying essentially is that there is one group. But as we know, um, uh, African American, Latino, Asian American, Native American, we all have different uh, agendas and we do not see the world necessarily in the same way, which means that we are, we are not the majority. We can form coalitions, but we're not the majority. And so if we don't understand that there is still a white majority that controls the systems in our society, then we uh, won't change the society. And a part of doing that is working with our children, uh, particularly our white children, to expose them to the world so that they don't get to college and see their first person of color in, the, in their uh, African American history class. They need to have those experiences before they get there. And so I'm all for the socialization. Um, I think the socialization is, it can't happen unless they see people who are not like them. <laughs>